All right, we're about 12.01 and um, we have a lot to get through with this amazing panel. Um, I'm Bessie Frank, I'm on the board of SF Big and we welcome everyone. Thank you Wall Street Journal for partnering with us uh, and putting this amazing topic together around news and what's going on in the industry. Um, and welcome to our, our community as well as those um, who are, are joining for the first time for an SF Big event. Um, today, we're really going to dive into uh, news and what's been going on in the past year. Trust has really been um, tested around government, news, media. So this amazing panel uh, that we work with Wall Street Journal on putting together is going to dive into, you know, how the state of the news is evolving. We're going to unearth how social media has given voice to the masses, really delve into promising practices for information hygiene. And which I feel like is a new term that we're going to be hearing a lot in the next year and really explore how these factors impact the marketing industry. So I'm going to turn it over to Rob, who's going to be our moderator and enjoy. Great. Thank you, Bessie. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's a lot to unpack. Um, so let me just quickly introduce myself and then um, I'll turn the mic over to the panelists so we can get to get to work. But um, my name is Robert Welch. I'm the Senior Vice President of Enterprise Media and Partnerships at the Wall Street Journal Barron's Group. And um, I oversee a lot of our commercial partnerships with some of our largest clients, including uh, Deloitte, Accenture, Raytheon Technologies, and Ernst & Young. Um, so today's topic, as Bessie mentioned, is trust to the test. Um, I'm going to be referencing some, some data and some stats from Edelman's Trust Barometer, um, and we'll get to that in a minute. But 2020 and so far in 2021, we've seen just an incredible um, acceleration in the news cycle. Um, but according to Edelman, trust in uh, not just news, but in governments and NGOs and media is at an all-time low. Um, in fact, across the board, trust, including search, traditional media, own media, and social media, has declined an average of 6% year over year. So we're going to talk a little bit about why that's happened, what it means um, for us as news consumers and as, as content consumers, but also as, as professionals in the industry. And we're going to explore a little in more detail um, about how leading news organizations, platforms, and agencies are thinking about trust and actively helping their clients navigate through this trust crisis. Um, so more on that in a minute, but let me first introduce our panelists. Uh, we've got Nick Salen, who's the head of U.S. News Partnerships at Twitter, and Cheryl Zhang, who's the account director and partner at Wavemaker. Um, I'm going to throw the mic to, to Nick and Cheryl to introduce themselves. And Nick, if you would start off, maybe just give us a quick background um, on your role at Twitter, you know, how long you've been there and, and your current roles and responsibilities. Sure. Hi, everyone. Uh, really nice to be here. Thank you, SF Big and uh, Wall Street Journal Barons for putting this on. Uh, it's, a, it's a great and, 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 and meaty and, and fascinating topic. Um, you know, so, so I've been at Twitter for coming up to six years. Um, I've predominantly, my, my time at Twitter has been um, focused on helping Twitter build um, commercial businesses around, um, you know, media and, and the media industry. So I started my time over at Periscope um, and really helping Periscope um, build out its partnerships um, with media companies. Um, I then moved uh, at working for, for, for the then CFO of Twitter, Anthony Noto, and helped him expand a deal that he cut with the NFL um, around Thursday Night Football to launch Twitter's live news business, which uh, led to, to, to partnerships with um, Bloomberg, BuzzFeed News, and a range of kind of big news organizations around um, premium live uh, news content. And I then moved to, to lead, um, you know, the, the U.S. News Partnerships Organization. And, and really, um, you, you know, our primary goal um, has been a commercial one, in fact. Um, news is a pretty broad remit at Twitter, as you can imagine. Uh, Twitter is, 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 is the hub and center, um, you know, of news and, and, and many of the, the world's leading journalists and policy makers and politicians come to Twitter to talk about news. But, but to me, and, and, and one of the, the trends that we saw is that one of the biggest threats to news um, is its uh, financial and economic future. And the big shifts that are happening in the media industry are, are really having um, an outsized and, and seismic impact on news organizations. And so we at Twitter wanted to think about ways in which we could help news organizations build a sustainable business um, on Twitter that enabled them, one, to develop um, content for Twitter users and audiences that was just authentic to their brand, but also to the way that audiences receive content 
natively on Twitter, um, rather than uh, cookie cutter approaches designed to, to share the same content across all, all social platforms. And the second part, you know, is to, to figure out a sustainable model for them to make money um, from advertising to realize a return on that investment in content. And so we're now at a point that we partner with, you know, dozens of, 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 of the world's leading uh, news organizations. And we're really, really focused on, on helping them, you know, with create, creating great quality information that's designed for Twitter audiences, you know, and monetizing that in, in information, you know, and, and, and scaling that monetization and ultimately scaling their investment in uh, journalism and, 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 and their newsroom. Um, so that's what I do today. It's a, it's a really rewarding and, and interesting place to be, as you can imagine. Um, and I'm excited to, to, to talk more about it uh, on this panel. Thanks for that, Nick. And and the Wall Street Journal is proud, and Barron's are, are proud to be one of the dozens of news organizations that that currently works with Twitter. Um, but before we dive into more detail on that, um, Cheryl, just over to you. Wanted to um, give you an opportunity to introduce yourself and give us a a quick um, overview of what you do at, at WaveMaker. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Rob. And, and nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, I come from a very different background to Nick. Um, I work in WaveMaker, which is a integrated media agency. Um, I've been at this place for 13 years and um, four years in the UK and six years um, in the US. And previously I worked on independent and um, digital agencies uh, in the UK. So my bread and butter is really in media planning buying and coming in from a very different place um, is to um, inject that revenue into news organizations to, to have that sustainable future that Nick is talking about. So how can we uh, navigate that conversation with the advertisers? How can we develop holistic communication strategies and media plans that can really uh, address those concerns from clients these days? And that's kind of where, where I'm coming in. Um, as a client lead, um, I think my role is, is tough. Um, I'm on the speed dial of many of my clients. They, you know, and they sent me questions. It could be from their CEO. It could be from their COO. Those are big, tough questions. What, what's keeping them up at night? And, and I need to be there to help and answer those internal questions and address their stakeholders' concerns. Um, and that's, um, that's part of my job. Um, and for, for the long term and short term, they need to grow their businesses. Um, so it could be any verticals, um, any clients um, in you know, CPG or FinServe or B2B. Um, every client needs to grow uh, in a way that will um, you know, address the, the shareholders and their investors' needs. And that's kind of where, where I'm coming in. That's great, Cheryl. And that's a, you know, being that. Um that that guide that's on speed dial you know the 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 person who's always available is um it, it, that can be challenging especially in a very fast news cycle when you're trying to um you know help your clients uh, make the most of their media investments but also you know be a, a steward of their brands i think it's a it's an interesting um line that we all have to walk and i think along those lines um let me just sort of dive into some of the the questions i had i had prepared around trust but i mentioned the trust barometer and how you know, trust really has um, uh, is in jeopardy at this point, um, based on what's happening in the news, and and frankly, a lot of it has to do with the sort of proliferation of news and what constitutes um, you know primary news and and industry best practices around reporting and accuracy. Um, but the trust barometer, and it's this isn't a Wall Street Journal product. We don't have a commercial or or any relationship with Edelman, but we do um, pay attention because we feel like we uh, as a news organization stand out because we are trusted. And that's one of the reasons why commercial partners wanna work with us. And frankly, one of the reasons why consumers are attracted to our brands. Um, but this study really revealed that this year, or last year in particular, and probably carrying over into 2021, there was an epidemic of misinformation and widespread, widespread mistrust. Um, I think we've all read about um, you know, disinformation and misinformation around elections, disinformation and misinformation around vaccine safety. Uh, you know, there are just about any topic you could find, um, you know, an echo chamber, you know, especially online, um, in reinforcing or, or underpinning any, just about any point of view on any topic. So I'd, I'd love to hear from maybe Cheryl, you go first, you know, how you think of trust 
um, for your clients in particular? And what do you have in place at Wavemaker to help, you know, be a good brand steward for your, for your customers? Yeah, thanks, Rob. Um, I think transparency is key here because um, the, the clients, they don't have the dashboard view of what we do and, and the agency side to really look at what is happening right now with their campaigns. Um, that level of trust can only be established with transparency and communications. Um, so on Wavemaker, we're very lucky. We're part of a larger media network called Group M, Group M and you hear me talk about Group M a lot because they um, are the leading voice in the industry establishing brand safety um, parameters. Uh, and Group M has a, a, an army of brand safety experts around the globe. Um, and I get constant updates on, you know, new things coming up, um, what are we doing uh, in terms of um, brand safety updates we're seeing in the, uh, in the industry and how we're responding to those uh, changes. Because um, it is ever evolving and things, things are changing by the hour and by the day. Um, and then when some major news break, um, advertisers want to know how, how should they react what is that decision tree? How do they go through that process and, and make those adjustments? Should we pause? Should we continue? Do we shift budgets? Um, and that differs by client as well. Um, everyone has a different risk tolerance level. Um, everyone has a different business model and campaign objectives. And we need to make those decisions together with the client. Um, and that is a collaboration. Um, so transparency, communications and collaboration, that goes um, a long way in that process um, to address those concerns. That, that's great. That's, that sounds like you have a, a good process and a good uh, you know, set of parameters um, that have been established. Nick, um, when you think about Twitter, less so from your end user, but more for, so for your commercial partners, you know, sort of how are you guarding you know, their investments and creating, you know, brand safe environments for them. I'd love to hear a little bit about, you know, because your Twitter is just so massive and you do have a lot of user generated content. How do you, you know, protect your commercial partners from, you know, content that might not be brand safe? Sure. Um, yeah, so, so we have a, a pretty um, fantastic um, product um, around, you um, that, that effectively enables brands to partner with and to uh, align with and to promote and amplify um, content from specific publishers of their choice around specific topics of their choice. It's called Amplify Sponsorships. It's a sponsorship program. It's the majority of kind of Twitter's content ad monetization business. And what it's allowed us to do is it's allowed us to, you know, highly curate um, packages of content that allow um, clients to um, invest in really pushing that specific item and aligning with that specific item and giving many controls of the kinds of content that can be picked. So I'll give you an example. Um, so when we partnered with Wall Street Journal, um, I believe it was two years ago, we created um, you know, a custom um, you know, series of, of original engaging clips around markets and what was happening um, you know, throughout the week. And we then took those clips and we packaged them up into, into different themes. We packaged them up into, you know, markets themes, which is, you know, typically brand suitable. There are certainly events in markets which brands will want to shy away from. But we, we really pick um, the, 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 the coverage that really, um, you, you know, is incredibly safe and, and, and makes sense for brands to align with. And, and, and so we package that, that kind of content up. And then we offer um, advertisers the ability to promote um, tweets with that video content in, insert a pre-roll in front of that video content, and then we share revenue back um, with the Wall Street Journal. And, and, and so that's the kind of nuts and bolts of how our program works. And, and at scale, what it means that we're able to do is to really um, uh, challenge the preconceptions around what is news when you buy into news and think about it more as high quality information um, and think about themes and topics that news organizations are just uniquely positioned to speak to. For example, you know, during the last year, 
there's been an incredible story around small business in the United States and around the dynamism um, and energy um, that has gone into um, you know, helping small businesses, you know, succeed, prosper, survive, adapt. Um, and there are stories every day, um, both macro level stories around what's happening to small business and employment as a whole, micro level stories around individual small businesses and how they've stayed afloat, how they've even found market opportunities. You know, and, and, and the news industry is uniquely positioned to create content around that. And we're uniquely positioned to package that content up and, and, and offer it to advertisers as, as ways to really align with positive um, uh, you know, stories you know, in, in, a, in a news landscape, which you know, has a lot of negative stories in it as well. Um, so that's kind of how we primarily think about it. Um, I can give some more examples about how we think about trust as, as a whole, um, you know, but, 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 but happy to, to stick to the commercial part of if, 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 if that's where you want to go with this. Well, I, I, yeah, I sort of wanted to think about brand safety from, a, from the commercial lens first. And then, uh, you know, from a consumer standpoint and a trust standpoint, that's where we start talking about information hygiene, which is kind of an icky term. You know, you think about bad information hygiene as, you know, I don't know if it's pig pen from the old uh, Peanuts comics comes to mind as somebody with, you know, bad personal hygiene, or I don't know, you think of the nutrition labels on, on food, lay, on uh, food products, you know, you want to make sure that your, your steady diet of news is, is uh, nutritious and comes from sources that are, you know, well-established. But um, I think that's more of a consumer, you know, topic, right? So when you think about information hygiene, um, and again, I, that's not maybe the term that I would have coined, but you think about, you know, how is the news produced? Is it produced by journalists who've been professionally trained? Is it sourced um, by, you know, credible news organizations that have editing standards in place and, and you know, ethical, um, an ethical obligation to only report things that are rigor rigorously vetted? Um, with that in mind, um, th this is more of sort of a trust. This goes back to the topic of trust. When you think about, um, you know, information sources. Uh, how are you, how are you, and I know that, that Twitter is doing a really, a much, much better job, frankly, in, you know, flagging content that might not be from credible sources or that might not be truthful, but I'd love to hear Nick from you first on, on that particular topic about information hygiene and what you're doing to protect your, your end users from content that might not be, um, you know, from the, from the most qualified sources. Sure, that, that, that makes total sense. I mean, as you can imagine, um, within a company like Twitter, th this kind of question, you know, hits um, uh, multiple teams across the organization. Um, and, and so you can imagine that there's a policy team that is thinking about, um, you know, what, 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 what policies do we use um, as a company to, uh, and, and how do we go about enforcing those policies and maintain consistency? Um, you know, there's a product team, um, you know, that's involved in thinking about um, signals and, and how to address, um, you know, different, different tweets and, 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 and different types of information. In my world, you know, what we look at is, is and, and what our biggest fear is, um, is that the, 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 the seismic shifts that are happening in the media industry, um, you know, both in terms of, um, you, you know, audiences moving um, and advertising moving. Um, how can we help the most high quality journalism driven news organizations scale their output, scale their commercial models, invest in their newsrooms and invest in content that frankly is designed specifically for audiences that are, you know, have short attention spans that are using Twitter in a way to get information very quickly. Um, you know, so, so, so I'll, I'll give you a classic example. Um, you know, around two or three years ago, a, a lot of um, the discussion was around Twitter putting long form content, video content on its platform. And the use case for Twitter isn't really around, you know, watching long form content for, you know, an hour. People scroll their, through their timelines. 
And so what we helped news organizations think about is how do you really cut that content up into clips so that you can deliver the information at the right um, with the right duration, um, exactly when um, you know audiences want it and when they need it, and that, that 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 is designed for the time constraints that they have in their own life and the time constraints they have specifically when they are you know looking to Twitter to give them information quickly. And so, so really, kind of equipping um, you know the, the the highest quality news organizations with the tools they need to engage their Twitter audiences, to grow their Twitter audiences, and then ultimately to monetize their Twitter audiences so they can invest further so that's the world that that, 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 that I look after and, and 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 think about you know I do think that there is a broader um, that the, the, the trust index and and how um, you know people think about trust is that that, that that often there's a there's a there's a notion that trust is shifting away from institutions and, and I think that that how we at Twitter think about that is is one how do we you know, how do we get quality information, get institutions sharing quality information in the right way for the platform, but also looking at individuals as sources of quality information as well. Uh, you, you know, you have a tremendous number of journalists that are on Twitter tweeting and discussing and um, talking about the day's events, you know, in the most authentic ways with just, you, you know, really high quality immediate information. And you're seeing, you know, that there are many consumers that are building, you know, affinities um, a, a, a around those individual users as well. So we like to think about how we can help news organizations, but we also like to think about the news ecosystem as a whole and, and think about quality information in a way that isn't constrained just to um, you know how big information how, how big big organizations you know disseminate it no, that's helpful I appreciate that I've worked for news organizations for uh, going on 20 years so I've always thought about and I've always you know, being on the sales side I've always talked about the news consumers being um, engaged you know more affluent than the average uh, you know than the average audience someone who's actually paying for content you know reads it differently than someone who's receiving it for free. Um, Cheryl, I'd love to hear from you about, you know, how, how does new, the, the, the news segment factor into your, uh, when you're making recommendations for your clients? I mean, is news something they're avoiding or selected, you know, or select news um, outlets, you know, whitelisted because of their credibility? I know you have a financial services client and a, and a big B2B client as well. So I'd love for you to just spend a few minutes telling us how you think about news and you know what you're um, you're leaning into or what you're potentially avoiding as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, news is a sensitive subject area, definitely. And I think some clients they feel less comfortable appearing in news right now, given their brand positioning. Um, I'll give an example of Bank of the West. Um, they are leading sustainable financing um, bank. Um, so, so they have a very distinct um, messaging around um, climate change, sustainability, and it, it is a politicized topic. So they rightly do not want to appear in news where climate change, you know, could be, um, you know, appearing in different ways that doesn't, you know, favor what they're trying to communicate. Um, and then we can't really, sometimes we can't control that editorial environment where climate change will show up. So, so we agree with the, the client, you know, maybe climate change related news isn't where we want to uh, appear. We might want to appear in eco-friendly um, lifestyle, green living um, kind of content. So that's where, where we would, you know, navigate that conversation. Um, with other clients, it might not be a sensitive area. Um, COVID news is ubiquitous, it's everywhere. We can't block COVID as a keyword. That means blocking half of the internet. Uh, we can't build an exclusion list based on um, websites and platforms who report out on COVID deaths. Um, but where we can uh, insert some um, safeguard rails uh, around COVID content is that we use semantic um, targeting. And I think 
uh, Wall Street Journal is bringing some uh, tools around that as well. So it's not just looking at certain keywords, it's looking at the um, editorial environment where those keywords are placed in. Um, so COVID death may appear in an article, um, we might not want to appear next to, to something like that, but we can target COVID related life tips, right? How people right. are having haircuts at home. Um, so yes, yeah, semantics is, is more important here than keywords. And so that's, that's the way we're heading. No, you, you make a really great point that context really matters and that the word COVID or the word climate change or the word sustainability um, uh, can mean different things in different in different contexts. Um, at, the, at the Wall Street Journal, we've developed a, a topic that we call um, safe key, and that is a way to basically take um, key phrases and, and words in context. And if it's a positive context, it would be whitelisted. And if it's obviously in a, in a negative context, it would be blacklisted for a client. And that's, this is a way for us to, you know, obviously open up more inventory, but but dive a little bit deeper than just a, a binary um, blocked word list. So I, I, I think that you make a great point. Um, I wanted to circle back on something a little bit more positive, which, which Nick touched on, which was um, obviously COVID um, and, and the pandemic that we're all, you know, living through and hopefully, um, you know, at hopefully coming out of here in the next few months has required small businesses, um, media companies, large businesses to, to really pivot and be nimble, um, do things differently, in some cases entirely rewrite their business models. I'd love to hear if there's an example, um, you know, Nick, first with you at Twitter where you've, um, I'm, I know your employees are all working remotely, but is there is there uh, something that you've done at the company that is, you know, COVID driven that is probably going to be a, a new best practice or something that stays, um, you know, well beyond, you know, the social distancing and the pandemic. So just, just, just to clarify, do, do you mean something kind of outside of, of, of what we're doing kind of, you know, within Twitter on the, on the news side of things? Do you mean, do you mean just the way that we're working as a, as, as, as a company? Yeah, I think I, either, either. I mm. mean, if there's an example of a way of working that you think is going to, uh, you know, transcend this this moment in time, or if there's a you know a new best practice as it relates to a, a product that you launched that, out of necessity that's now become commercially viable. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think the latter to me is 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 the part that I've been most focused on. Um, um, you, you know, we, we, Twitter as a, as a company has quite aggressively um, you know been ahead of the. The, the, the pandemic, we were the first to to to, to have employees work from home, etc., and um, and and not require them to come back to work. So so that's all all kind of happening. Uh, you know, I think that that you know what what was interesting to me, you, you know, was you know in Q, at the end of Q one of last year when when the pandemic hit, ultimately from a from a content partnerships and, and, and commercial content packages for advertisers perspective, that dealt the sports partnerships business and the entertainment partnerships business significant challenges because the, the, the content that those businesses relied upon, you know, which were, you know, matches and games, you know, award shows and live events, um, you know, all of a sudden, you know, were no longer, you, you know, a thing. And, and, and you know, at the same time, on the news front, you know, we're less dependent on live events. Um, and this is within the Twitter business. We understand that live events are a big business for, for, for news organizations, um, you, you, you know, in terms of building thought leadership, et cetera. But, but live events was something that, 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 that wasn't huge for us from a monetization. What, what was really driving the Twitter news engine was that all of a sudden, there was a huge amount of really important information and 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 the engagement and interest to boot so we saw just a hugely influential and engaged audience that were were desperate for information around what was happening around the pandemic um, you know at a time where entertainment and sports weren't able to um, you know really um, that th their business had, had changed Fundamentally, for us, the challenge was how do we um, make this glut of high quality information and huge demand for it commercially feasible and viable? 
And so one example I gave earlier was that we started to tell um, you know, a story around small businesses. We also started to tell um, stories around rebuilding America, around um, the next chapter for America, um, and, and, and started to, to, to really create these, these topic-based thematic vehicles that allowed um, advertisers to tap into you know, where all the engagement and energy was, but focused entirely on the positive story around rebuilding our economy, around, um, you, you know, the growth and how we're going to get out of this, around the facts um, about COVID and, 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 and things that people could do around it. And, and we, we our, our business grew, um, you know, I, Q, Q, Q2 was, 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 a, was a shock for, for, for many, um, but, but we really started to build our business because it changed the way we were thinking about news we weren't just out trying to sell you know a wall street journal package we were thinking much bigger around you know how wall street journal reporting you know could ladder up to a theme that has complete relevance um, and that everyone's talking about and that everyone's engaging with and 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 that that really that that model persists today and and it and, it, and it's been responsible for a lot of growth and i and i see it persisting um you know for a long time to come that pivot into more service journalism where you're actually providing, you know, that, that guide, that, that meaningful guidance, um, that news that is actionable. Um, yeah, we, we've seen That's the same. Exactly thing. right. Yeah. Uh, sure. I want to ask you the same question, but first I just want to remind the audience, if you have questions, please submit them. I think we'll have time at the end to, to, to get to a handful of your questions. Um, but Cheryl wanted to, to pose the same question to you, obviously your business, um, has changed, you know, I don't think your business model has necessarily changed, but I'd love to hear if any, you know, if the dark clouds of the, the pandemic have resulted in any sort of silver linings, um, any, any new ways of working uh, either inside of Mindshare or, you know, with your clients, would love to hear if there are any, you know, bright spots um, as a result of the last, the last year that's been obviously very difficult for, for many people. Yeah, certainly has been. Um, there are definitely some silver linings. Um, I think on a personal level, um, any moms who have been working from home and got small kids at home, we, we managed to spend more time with our loved ones. That's definitely a silver lining I couldn't really foresee when the pandemic started. Um, but with the business, um, there are certain um, uh, sort of new economy brands flourishing as a result of COVID. And a couple of the, the clients we manage, uh, including DoorDash, you know, the CBG brands, they, they are booming. E-commerce is booming, right? So, so those, I think, um, shifts we are seeing, um, they are going to continue post-COVID. Uh, we call them SCAR rather than SCARP. And so, you know, where people are not going to shopping malls anymore, they, they probably will do majority of their shopping online. That's not going back, right? And so once people get used to, um, you know, doing all their grocery shopping in, in Instacart, it, they might not want to go back to right. the grocery stores. Um, so there are definitely some shifts we're seeing and in terms of the way we are working with clients. Um, I think coming back to news, there's some initiatives I've seen in the marketplace, such as Triple Lift, um, such as multicultural private marketplace we established with Group M. Um, those are positive changes we're trying to make and push the industry towards uh, where we can uh, maintain revenue streams for credible local news organizations. I'd hate to see another cre um, credible local newspaper die because they couldn't get more advertising dollars. Um, so, so those changes are happening. Um, I think COVID exacerbated some of those um, uh, revenue streams, but at the same time, there, um, there are also new revenue uh, going in from those booming new economy brands like DoorDash. Um, right. So that, that's positive from my perspective. Absolutely. Before we, um, before we kicked off, I was having a, a separate conversation with, um, with Bessie about, you know, the gaming communities that are flourishing and, the, the Peloton users that are obviously um, working out in new ways and what that means for, you know, sort of this hybrid way of getting fit or staying fit. Um, I just wanted to ask, ask a community related question. 
Um, it, at the Journal, at, at the Dow Jones, at Dow Jones and, and the Wall Street Journal, we think about communities. Um, you know, every single day, it's a big part of our business. We have um, you know 80 million unique users a month and almost four million paying members. And of those members, we're thinking about how to super serve them, how to give them you know more value for their for their membership or for their subscription. Um, we're thinking about how they can to create ways for them to network with one another, um, as well as get closer to our editors and our content creators, right? So the, the networking piece is important because when we think of our products, they really reach a B2B audience. And if we're encouraging them to do business and to, to get to know one or get to know each other better, there's a, there's a tremendous you know, exponential commercial benefit to that. So I'd love to hear from, from you, Nick, about your communities I know you talked a bit about how you've sort of organized your content, um, but when you think about communities, what are your sort of most important audiences, and how do you how do you connect with them? Yeah, it makes it makes total sense. I mean, I think that um, you know, from, from my perspective, it, I would love to be in a position where we're really thinking about um, you know specific audiences. Um, for the content that we develop. I think that the, 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 the reality um, is that, that, that so often the, 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 the economics of the content business forces many publishers to create content that is um, really designed for, for every platform. And, and for us, the, the, the real kind of challenge is to help um, build the business model such that the, 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 those companies can really invest in kind of Twitter audiences. And when we think about Twitter audiences, we're thinking, um, you know, uh, really as, as folks that are super, super engaged in news um, and that, that, behave, that have speci specific kind of behavioral characteristics <clears throat> in the way that they scroll, <clears throat> in the way that they kind of access news. Um, and, and we're thinking less about kind of the, the community aspect. I, I would say that the, the, the community aspect really comes in, you know, with respect to the content that we um, really try to bring to market and that we really kind of push our, um, you know, content partners to um, invest in and to create. And, and that's really around, you know, it, you know, where we're seeing a lot of interest is, is, is on the quiet climate, um, on um, kind of the future of everything, which is, you know, a Wall Street Journal franchise and thinking about, um, you, you know, um, what the future looks like and, and, and content around that and building communities of engaged audiences around those themes, um, you, you know, and, and, and advertisers that can, can in turn invest in them. So I think that that's more kind of how we think about it. That's on my, top, my side of the business. The, the marketing side of Twitter's business and the product side of Twitter's business is thinking very specifically around communities and how to build products for different communities and how to um, reach different communities and, and bring different communities onto the platform. Um, that, that exists a little bit outside of my world. Um, you, you know, so that's probably my best, my best way of explaining it. Thanks, Nick. No, that, that's helpful. And I, I appreciate the distinction between your side and the and, and the marketing side, the end user side. Um, Cheryl, do you do you spend a lot of time thinking about communities? I mean, obviously the the uh, Bank of the West has, you know, they they're thinking about, you know, borrowers and mortgage lending, and they're thinking about, you know, personal checking clients and you know, commercial banking opportunities. But are you spending a lot of time trying to to develop those segments and and to really you know, nail the product offering or the specific messaging for those specific communities? Yeah, Rob, I think um, communities are so hard to maintain these days virtually when, you know, we're spending more time apart. Um, and then trying to identify communities and grassroots level is really difficult because um, new, um, I think new influencers emerging <laughs> on a weekly basis. Um, it's hard to know, you know, who, who shall we activate to tap into these um, communities? Um, but then I think um, WaveMaker, there's also a larger community, um, you know, uh, within the media agency that we need to make sure people stay connected. Um, and that I think is more of an important community um, to manage when everyone's working remotely. And, and for my team, 
not everyone's in San Francisco. We're working across the country. Some people have worked remote for over a year and right. I had new team members joining us remotely. And how can we ensure that they feel that they're part of the community and they don't feel like they, you know, just talking to people they don't know. And, and I think that's more important to, um, to establish a community within our organization before we, we start to, you know, engage with clients and um, try to talk about the community at large uh, within their target audience. It's first, we need to feel like a community within our own, own agency. I completely agree. And, and any big company has, you know, now a fully distributed or mostly distributed workforce. And so how do you, how do you build that corporate culture? How do you maintain it? How do you keep an eye on, you know, people's uh, well-being? Um, it, it's extraordinarily difficult, something that is going to require certainly more attention and more work. Um, I have one more question, and it's kind of to end on a more positive note, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, go to the audience. But we have uh, at the... One of the, I think, silver linings in the Edelman research is that the, um, the one institution that is seeing a, an increase in trust is um, companies. You know, there's an increase in trust in business. Uh, it was only up two points, but, you know, we'll take it. That is a, that's a, a meaningful outlier when everything else is declining. 86% um, of the survey respondents said they expect CEOs to demonstrate leadership on societal challenges, and that includes... Uh, the pandemic response that includes um, local community issues. Um, it includes um, issues around, uh, you know, shifting demographics and and talent in the workforce and job automation. Um, so I think, you know, and this is a little bit self-serving because my my group does a lot of work with CEOs and companies that want to project some thought leadership and and be vocal on some of these topics. But I'd love to hear, um, you know, what you think about that um, either at Twitter or with any you know examples um, around maybe the stand the NFL is taking or um, with your advertisers at, at, at um, Wavemaker would love to hear you know what your either executives at your companies or your, your customers are doing to kind of steer into this this void that's been created by the decline in trust elsewhere you know um, I, I would say oh sorry. I was gonna say, yeah, Nick, over to you first. Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, yeah, I, I was gonna say that um, really on the kind of sales side of the business, the, the, the side of the business that, that talks the most to companies um, and talks the most to companies about how they present themselves and represent their views on Twitter. You know, we are really, really focused on helping them um, you know, build authenticity into their message. And, 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 it, and, and the problem, the problem that, 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 that Twitter presents in that respect is that it's often authenticity at great speed um, because often these issues will come up rather suddenly and you'll be faced with options and um, you know, how you would respond and how you present yourself on Twitter organically, how you, um, you know, would, would, would buy media on Twitter to represent your, your points of view. And I think that we're really focused on arming our clients with the tools that they need to react um, authentically at speed um, and, and, and to really, um, you know, to take a stand, um, you know, to be outspoken um, and to be, um, you know, authentic and, and, to, and, and, and to, to, to present the, the right message. So that, that's a lot of the work that, that we do, you know, around, um, you know, helping companies be authentic and build that trust and, 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 and build into that opportunity. I, I would say secondly, you know, more on the partnership side of the business, you know, when you look at the Wall Street Journal's output and you look at, you know, companies like Tesla that have these massively engaged, you know, highly trusting audiences, you, you know, figuring out how, how to report, um, and 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 not you, you you figure that part out, but but we figure out how how to surface this incredible reporting, you know uh, what, what the right cadence for updating your audiences on these kind of passion companies where there's a huge amount of trust, you know, and and how to um, you, you know b build into the to the news on this, uh, and so I think that that there are definitely communities of Twitter around Twitter that are passionately passionate about 
products, services companies that have incredible connections with them. And, you know, really our goal is to help those companies find those audiences and expand them, um, but also, you know, to help our news partners tap into the, 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 the re reporting um, and, and uh, around those companies that are getting a lot of attention. Um, you know, so that, 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 that's how I would, you know, think how, how we think about it or tend to think about it. I appreciate that, Nick. And Cheryl, back to you just around this topic of, of uh, you know, business filling this trust void with, you know, meaningful commitments around, you know, whether it's sustainability or social action or social justice. Are you, um, from where you sit, either as an executive at, at Wavemaker or with your clients, what are some of the more meaningful, you know, examples of this that you've been a part of or, or seen in the last in the last six months? Yeah, I'll give one example, which I'm really proud of, and I'm actually part of, um, is the Group M externship program. I don't know how companies can manage the internships these days when we are working remotely, but the externship program um, is um, targeted on um, recent graduates, um, still college students from ethnic minority background who would like to enter the media industry, who would like to talk to someone who's currently working in the industry and just to get insider tips. And I've had, you know, some one-on-one -on -one mentoring uh, discussions with um, this um, graduate from New York. Um, she just wants me to look at her resume and I did that and we had great chat. She has so many questions for me. Um, so that's meaningful and tangible ways for companies to make a difference. And I think in terms of what the CEO or what, you know, the, the senior leadership could do, I think as a start, um, our CEO, she was part of the mentoring program. Um, we started and wave maker last year. She mentored someone who she would otherwise never speak with. Uh, and she shared her learnings uh, with the whole company during our town hall. And it was just eye opening that, you know, for a CEO, she would take time to do that. And just one takeaway for me from, from that discussion, she said, you know, every time she makes a decision these days, she asks her, herself, would this matter in five years time? Right. What, I'm, what I'm currently thinking and trying to make a decision on. If it doesn't, then, then let's move on. Um, and that's eye opening. And, and to know that she gained something from that mentoring program is great. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. I mean, it's not, not um, that different. I, I spent the bulk of my day yesterday interviewing a handful of interns for our summer internship programs and was just blown away by their, uh, their poise and their um, awareness around, you know, diversity and inclusion issues and social justice issues that are articulate. And, you know, I, I was reminded that great ideas and, and you know, business uh, in, initiatives can come from all places, including people that don't even work for your company yet. But that's, um, that's great to hear. Really great to hear. So I have a couple of questions that came in from, from the audience. Um, I'll ask this one as a jump ball. If any, if either of you would like to answer this one, that would be great. Um, have you seen a shift in, in sales activity? Can you share trends you're seeing either internally with different types of activity or overall sales increases or de decreases? So if I understand that, um, are you seeing meaningful shifts in, in sales um, patterns? I don't know, maybe, maybe that's not a great question. Although someone did say it was a good question. Yeah, can you share the trends you're seeing? Um, I, I mean, well, I, 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 yeah, I, I can jump I in. Can, I could take a stab. Oh, do you want to go, Robert? You can. Yeah. Well, let me take a stab at that one, and sure, maybe maybe it. that'll stimulate a conversation. But at at the Wall Street Journal Barons Group, we have seen some some shifts in in sales activity. We are seeing. Um, I don't know if you could call it a, a flight to quality. Um, we think because we do have a strong brand and a, a strong commitment to trust, we're seeing a lot of, we're seeing record digital growth, um, frankly. And part of that is coming from, you know, traditional display advertising. Some of it is um, coming from a, a jump in, in programmatic, but a lot of it is coming from um, our custom content studio. So we're doing a lot of content creation on behalf of our clients. And that's a fundamental change in, um, in our business. I mean, we are, we used to be very print centric and now we are really creating um, thought leadership and helping distribute thought leadership for our clients um, across Dow Jones. So that's, if I'm reading the question correctly, that's my version of how I would answer that one. But does that, does that resonate with either of you? 
Yeah, I, I would say that um, that you know broadly that there was a big reaction from the industry around you know some of the trends you know in the last four or five years around brand safety and use, and there there, there, there was there was a real a lot of real advertiser concerns. There was a lot of concern. There were a lot of concerns for the future of the business um, in light of, of decisions to reallocate or not invest in, in news. And then there was a big response, I would say, from industry leaders to say, hold on a second. This is this this is brand suitable content when packaged in the right way. Um, you know, this is content that gets a huge amount of engagement and it's a societal benefit to invest in that content and you've seen you know advertisers like bank of america really kind of get behind that sort of message um and so what we've seen is that, that we've been building our news advertising product you know in this context and we're seeing a lot more advertiser interest in it um and i would say that combined with this um, pandemic trend where news organizations have just been able to provide such a huge amount of high quality content with such engaged audiences and have become so deft at creating, you know, uh, finding the content that really is brand suitable and um, uh, decoupling it from the content that isn't, but that needs to be out there too. And, and really packaging that up correctly. Uh, you know, I think we're seeing, you know, really positive effects from that. Um, you know, so, so I would say that's been a shift for us, um, a welcome one and, and one that we intend to continue to build into. Perfect. We've only got a couple of minutes left. So Cheryl, over to you. Are you seeing, um, you know, either shifts in uh, media, I guess media formats might be the, the better way to put this. Are your, your clients leaning into, you know, creating their own content? distributing it or do they are they building out you know in-house you know news or or content creation um yeah is, are they taking that function in-house um not necessarily in-house but i think clients want to be in the driver's seat when it's um you know content creation and content partnerships they want to have total control of the narrative and the messaging Right, so, so the key talking points, they want to make sure that that comes across um, about what their um, products and solutions are about. Um, and that is shifting to your point, um, Rob, there's more dollars going towards digital tactics for sure. Um, you know, moving away from print out of home and just, you know, any other traditional media in general. Um, but I think for news, um, we do see more hesitation from advertisers. And, and that's understandable. And that's up to the industry to move, um, you know, in the right direction um, in the coming um, years <laughs> to, to rebuild that trust. Um, I think for advertisers to fully um, invest in news, um, we, we still have a, a way to go. Uh, without a doubt. I think, yeah, there's work to be done and I, I really appreciate the conversation. And I think we've, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, I hope that we were, um, you know, we stayed we stayed on point, but I want to thank everyone at SF Big um, for for the opportunity to to spend a few minutes and and to chat with everyone. And um, Nick, thank you, Cheryl, thank you. It's been a real pleasure. And um, as uh, just to sign off here, thank you for for being a part of today's conversation. Uh, we really really appreciate it. Thank you so much, everyone. Really thank you. enjoyed enjoyed it. It's been great. Same thank here. you. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Bye, guys.